Okay. Um, well, we got a, a there's a wonderful event that goes on. It's like the Nate Nelson Algren kind of birthday party, I guess, every year. Uh, Warren Lemming and a number of others have been on the show talking about it. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I'm sure it's been going on, and maybe I just didn't pay attention, but a couple of guys who've been connected with that event and have been working on an Algren film are uh, Blotter and Mueller. That's Blotter and Mueller. That's Mark Blotter and Dennis Mueller. And uh, I've known these guys for a long time, and I know they both have been involved in making films, and they have a new film about Nelson Algren coming out. So good morning to you, gentlemen. Good morning. It's uh, nice to be back in Chicago at the Heartland. Right. Good morning, Michael. And Tom. So tell and us about how um, this project came together, which is going to be seen this afternoon at 3 o'clock at the Siskel Center and through the course of the week, the other show times. So how long has this labor of love been on your plate? Well, it's been a, it's been a long time. It's been 25 years, Tom. Um, I started this uh, early on with Warren Lemming and Stuart McCarroll from the Algren Committee. And... Uh, uh, basically ran into some financial struggles, had to put it on the shelf for a while, brought it back in 2012, brought uh, my friend Dennis here, co-producer, co-director on the project. And and when Mark sent me this, he called me, he called me up and said, would, he be, would I be interested in working and finishing the Nelson Algren project? I was doing another film, but it was one of those documentaries with my old partner, Deb Ellis, called Peace Has No Borders, but that is waiting for events to happen. So I said, sure. Mark sent me some stuff that he had videotaped. I might have helped him on a shot or a couple shoots, but it was Studs Terkel, Kurt Vonnegut, Algren's friends, Stu McCarroll. And when I looked at the material, I looked at it and went, holy camoly, this is worth more now than when it was shot because um, it's, they're no longer here. And so I knew that there was something special. I then saw this clip that Warren Lemming and Carmen Servi had did um, called Algren's Last Night. And out of that, I went, oh, I think there's a way to make this into kind of a film noir-like story of Nelson Auger. And I immediately contacted um, my friend and the other co-filmmaker, Ilko Davidov, and showed him a couple clips and said, hey, you know, does this capture your interest? Should we pursue this, this particular look? And he said, yes. So that's how our three of us came together. And then, you know, finished it in a remarkably quick period of time after that. So could one of you give us a quick synopsis of who this Nelson Algren was? We do have some younger listeners who may not have a clue who we're talking about. Well, Nelson Algren was a, uh, a local Chicago writer who uh, came up through the uh, 30s, a proletarian writer initially, uh, eventually uh, expanded his work into... Um, short stories and then the novel, um, the winner of the first National Book Award in 1949, The Man with the Golden Arm. The important thing to remember about Nelson Algren is his, uh, the characters in his stories. He wrote about, he was really the first person in American literature to write about prostitutes and pimps and small time thieves and hustlers and in a, in a, in a real way from their, using their own uh, vernacular. It was kind of a, a Mark Twain of the 20th century as it were. You know, the, the first time I really heard about Algren was when I was working in Uptown uh, and uh, a woman named Peggy Terry, who we eventually ran for vice president with Eldridge Cleaver on the Peace and Freedom ticket, she gave me the book Chicago City on the Make. And in that book, uh, there's a, at the very beginning of the, the early edition that I had, I don't think it's in later ones, it says, somewhere between St. Such and Such and North Troy Street, Chicago divided my heart, making me love the joint forever, but knowing she never loved me. And I just, I loved it. And because I was learning, I was discovering Chicago, and uh, that was the way it was. You know, it was a, a split city in a lot of ways, not like unlike today. But uh, uh, tell us how you guys got interested in Algren to begin with? Well, um, we were all living in Wicker Park at the time in the late 1980s. And um, I sh Mark started a, a film, and this is when the Nelson Algren committee ha had started. And they were trying to resurrect Algren's um, in Chicago. There was like no books in the library right. of his. Algren was banned from the library. 
Whereas Saul Bellows got uh, anointed in some ways. He, uh, yeah, so he was like a, a, a neighborhood icon. And, uh, and Mark is an early young man, and he should probably tell us, started interviewing some incredible people. Sure. Uh, so I, I moved to uh, the Wicker Park neighborhood, uh, late 80s, hung out at uh, some of the dive bars, as other artists did. Uh, Phyllis's Musical Inn, Gold Star, Rainbow Club, etc., and started to learn a little bit about the culture, the neighborhood. Nelson came up right away. Uh, I was living with a writer at the time who turned me on to uh, one of his uh, collections of short stories called The Neon Wilderness. And there's a fantastic story in there called How the Devil Came Down to Vision Street. From that point on, I was sold. Nelson really brought to life, those words brought to life the people. You could, as you walk down the streets of Division, in the neighborhoods, you could feel the, 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 the ghosts of those people alive. And you can also still see those folks drinking in the bars and um, basically uh, on the street still, homeless, walking, lost. One of the things I think that makes Algren's writing ex not only just exceptional, but different, and in a strange way, we tried to do this in the film, too, is that um, Algren writes about the poor, the dispossessed, but not in a patriarchal type way. I mean, if they have created some of their own problems, he doesn't shake his finger at them and say, you've created your own problems, but expresses their humanity in all its context. So what we tried to do in our film as well is reveal Algren in the same way. I mean, he's a great writer, and sometimes, but sometimes the FBI got Algren, and sometimes Nelson got Nelson. So uh, I think one's humanity comes out better when you reveal them with all their blemishes. I, one thing to point out, and I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I, I, I didn't know about Algren until I moved to We're Chicago. Playing you guys tonight, the Bulls play Cleveland. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> Just thought you wanted to know that. <laughs> but uh, my point is that uh, Nelson really, okay, one of the first things I wondered, why didn't I know about this guy? This is a fantastic writer, one of the greatest writers of our time. Why did I not know about him? There's the mystery. So that's what we try to solve in this story. Why is Nelson not better known? Uh, you know, uh, beside my bed is a poster from the Nelson Algren birthday party, and it's a picture of Nelson. Uh, it's a mug shot. I think it's from a reefer bust. Uh, let me, let me ask you how the, the FBI going after him and the criticisms that he was taking affected his writing in the 50s and beyond. Okay. In 1942, he catches the attention of the FBI because of his book, Never Come Morning. The uh, Polish Alliance sends a letter to the director, and he becomes on their list. As the Second World, which kind of isn't paid much attention to until the Second World War is over, and the business wing of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party um, give the go-ahead to look at these former radicals. And Algren was a former radical. There's a no, a no way you can die, deny that. He, there's a thousand pages of FBI files of Nelson Algren. So what we tried to do in our film was to create the FBI as a character, but a character outside that you never see, like he never saw the FBI. You know, he didn't know that his male person was an informant. So th this had a profound effect on him by them taking his passport away f so he could no longer see the French existentialist and his lover, Simone de Beauvoir. And at double day, canceled his book contract. So it had an adverse effect on his career. Uh, there's, there's so many uh, influences against Algren at this point. So, um, quick synopsis. Nelson is most impacted by his time on the road in the 30s. Right? He, he, he graduates from um, University of Illinois in 31, goes out on the road, can't get any work, ends up homeless, rides the rails, eventually ends up in Texas, uh, ends up getting uh, arrested for stealing a typewriter to write his first novel. All right, this is, the, this is the experience that he continually uses to draw upon in all his writing from that point on. 
the fact of, of living on the road and people being seen only through the eyes of, of, of dollar signs. So, uh, so it's no surprise that you know during the Red Scare era of the 50s that Nelson is certainly amongst the top on, on their list. And um, I want to point out too that, uh, that, that Nelson was uh, the, 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 real, the, the real key factor in, in um, uh, the FBI going after Nelson was he was, uh, as, as any artist was, they were in support of, of the Rosenbergs. Uh, they wanted to have some clemency for the Rosenbergs and, that, and when that, uh, when the uh, Rosenbergs were executed, um, that wasn't, it wasn't a very good uh, event for Nelson or anybody else who was supporting that. But Nelson's name was on, were, were, he had signed papers and uh, he had also at that point um, uh, was was uh, under uh, uh, certainly under, under uh, uh, surveillance nonstop. So you're a young person from Cleveland, a young filmmaker. How did you end up interviewing people like Studs Terkel or Clancy Siegel for this? Well, early on, and Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut, yes, fantastic writer. Um, well, early on, I got uh, in touch with Bettina Drew, the, uh, who had written the definitive biography of Nelson Algren, Life on the Wild Side. Uh, this is via Stuart McCarroll, the Algren Committee. And, and Bettina, I interviewed Bettina, and then she passed on her contacts. Uh, and she's been tremendously supportive. We also interviewed her uh, most recently. We went back and got uh, the interview again with her because things have changed over time. So the film is The End is Nothing, The Road is All, and it's going to be at Cisco. Give us a little information about the, when it's being shown, how people can see it, et cetera, et cetera. It's being shown at 3 o'clock today um, at the Gene Siskel Theater. There will be a question and answer afterwards. It's a beautiful day. Please come. I'm especially happy that it's being shown on State Street which across from the Chicago theater where the State Lake used to be. And that's a nice fit for Algren. So please come and see uh, a nice film. All right, I, I want to thank uh, Tom and Michael for having us. And also uh, I want to mention we opened the film with a piece from Nelson from the book, Who Lost an American? And it's called Candidate for the Blind. So in this election season, it's very appropriate. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on. Mark Blotter, uh, Dennis Mueller, thanks a lot for uh, talking about Nelson Algren.